and snobs. Sometimes that's the audience you have. And Paul, knowing this, tried to build a bridge with these snobbish Greek intellectuals. They already had developed an ill opinion of him. Uh, They said, let's see what this seed picker has to say. A seed picker was a bum. A seed picker was a charlatan, somebody of low consequence. And so they made light of him, but they wanted to hear what he had to say because they were idle. And as the Bible says, they spent all day in the marketplace just speaking, scooping us to speak or to hear some new thing. And so what Paul said was of interest to them. And so he built a bridge to them by appealing to their common humanity their common humanity. In other words, he broadened the arena. He broadened the arena of ideas to say, I'm a person and you're a person. You are people and I am also a person and we share a common humanity. And we find uh, this articulated very well in Acts chapter 17, verse 24 through 28. And he's introducing God. He's introducing the God of creation. God that made the world and all things therein. That, that's how he presents God. He's the creator God. He made the world and all things that are therein, which means you and I. He's the creator of all of us. Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing he giveth all, including you and me, life and breath and all things, and hath made of, and here it is, one blood, one blood, which is the same thing as saying one race, one common humanity. He has made of one blood all nations, ethnoi, culture groups, people groups. He has made of one blood, of one common humanity, all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Meaning God is involved in how the nations operate, where they're placed, and their governments and things of that nature. That they, the people of the earth, the people who have one blood, should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not very far from every one of us, us humans. For in him we, we human beings who are of one blood, in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. What he is saying is this, that the God of creation and his scriptures say that we're all one. And even there are those in your culture who say this, that we are all God's offspring. So I'm appealing on the basis of our common humanity, our common one world race of people. Since I have been a teenage boy, I have been a student of the issue of race. And through scripture and through many years of working through this, uh, I have come to this. There is only one human race, and the rest is made up baloney. It's stuff that we have invented out of whole cloth. The color of one's skin uh, is of no consequence when it comes to humanity. It's just a blip on the genetic file. It has uh, no meaning unless we assign it a meaning, and sadly people have done so. Uh, We are all human beings. We are all made in the image of God. We all share a common ancestry. We are all of one human race. And so the issue is complicated, but it's only complicated because we have made it complicated. It's not complicated with God. It's not complicated with Christ. It's not complicated with His Word. And there's an ongoing debate, and perhaps you've heard this uh, in your uh, reading or, you know, watching uh, uh, documentaries or anything like that. And there's this idea of what what makes us who we are. Why are we the way we are as individuals, for example? And and the, the issue is put this way often, is it nature or is it nurture? And that's a clever way of saying, are we the way we are because of our inherited traits 
Or are we the way we are because of what we have learned, what we have been taught, what our environment has brought us to be? And I am of the opinion that while there are certain inherited things that we may have, they are of minimal consequence. The greater influence that determines who we are is what we learn, uh, our environment, what uh, we have experienced, what we have acquired through time. Uh, for instance, uh, you cannot take a, a, a white person and raise them in an entirely black culture without expecting them to adopt the speech patterns, mannerisms, thoughts, and values and culture of that environment. On the other hand, if you take a black person and put them in a white environment and raise them uh, in that environment, they will reflect that environment. That The skin color does not innately bring with it a set of values or a culture. Culture is learned. Culture is something that we experience with our minds and hearts. There is no innate human culture. So when it comes to nature or nurture, it is more nurture than nature. Now, a subcategory of this question, and one that I've studied for many years, because it's been fascinating to me, uh, this concept uh, of, uh, we see here Paul, and he's talking to the Greeks. Now, uh, the Greek world had spread far and wide. It had spread to Israel. It had spread to Syria, that area just north of Israel. It had spread as far as all the way to the borders of India. And much of the world at that time had become what they call Hellenized. That is, the Greek culture had so influenced them that they spoke Greek. Their schools uh, taught uh, in the Greek pattern, and many people had become more Greek than Jewish, or more Greek than Syrian, or more Greek than Egyptian. Uh, the world had been Hellenized, and so in, in the days of Paul, you were either a Jew or a Gentile, which was the same thing as saying a Jew or a Greek. And so here is Paul in the very epicenter of Greek culture. And he is looked upon as a nobody. And he is looked upon by a group of snobs. But he also realized this. The Jews also could be snobs. They called the Greeks dogs. They called the Gentiles swine. Uh, they had laws made up by men that said you couldn't even go into uh, the house. You couldn't share the same roof with a Greek or with a Gentile. Uh, you couldn't eat with them at the same table. Uh, there was a division, and it wasn't as much a color division. It was a cultural division. Uh, they had this problem with one another. And so Paul is a bridge builder, not a wall builder. He is a Christian. He is a missionary. He's trying to make the gospel go out to everyone, and through the gospel, draw people together in common love and unity and peace and cooperation. In other words, he is God's very ambassador for racial healing. And what he's trying to do is to bring them to Christ, who is, by the way, the answer of the problems of the world, and the only answer that will work. So, when he said one blood, he was appealing to them on the basis of humanity. Now, at present in the West, and in our country, in America in particular, we are in the midst of societal tension. And this nature or nurture question could also be stated as a question of color or culture. Color or culture. What is it in America to be white? Does that mean something? And if it does, why does it mean something? And what made it mean what it means? What does it mean in America to be, for instance, black? Why does it mean something, and what does it mean, and why does it mean what it means? How, how did this come about? Uh, is it color that we have a problem with, or is it culture, or is it a combination, or is it something that we've just totally made up and bought into that doesn't come from God, but comes from the world? These are things we're wrestling with. When is someone a bigot? And is color and culture the same thing? Or are these two totally separate things? It's extremely important. Listen, it's extremely important that as Christians, we draw our worldview from Scripture. 
We draw our world view from God's revealed Word. To draw our world view from Scripture is to be on the right side of history. Because all the history hasn't been written yet. One day there will be one who will be King of kings and Lord of lords, and all nations shall bring their glory into New Jerusalem. One day there will be peace, there will be unity, and it will be under the King of kings and Lord of lords, and no one else is going to be able to do that except Christ. So, society has proven itself to be wrong time and time again. If you draw your worldview from society, look out. You're in for trouble. You see, society makes what is right today wrong tomorrow, and what is wrong today right tomorrow. Society will flip in a decade. It is capricious. It is ever-changing. The values cannot be counted upon because they are related to the mood of the times or to the influence of strong individuals who may be entirely wrong. So society is a dangerous place from which to draw one's worldview. For instance, society once taught that babies with even minor birth defects should be left to die. Christians who had a scripture-based worldview, saw that practice and said, No! We challenged it. We pointed at it, called it wrong, and said, No. Society used to say that the widow of a man who died should throw herself on the funeral fire and sacrifice herself. That was practiced in India for centuries. Christians who saw this said no and pointed at it and called it wrong. And eventually society caught up with Christians and changed the practice. Society used to say that gladiatorial shows in which men got into arena and and fought to the death in bloody battles for the entertainment of spectators. Society said that's fine. That's okay. That's good entertainment. Christians looked at this barbaric practice and said, No! And eventually society changed to conform to the wiser, more kind, more humane views of Christ and His followers. For many, many, many years, since the dawn of humanity actually, slavery has permeated uh, the human world. In all cultures, in all nations, all over the world, Slavery was an accepted thing. There may have been critics of it. There may have been people who didn't like it. But it was accepted. It was often made legal. And it was something that was very much a part of the world. Christians finally, it took some time in some places, but they finally looked at it, prayed about it, sought wisdom, and said, No! This is wrong! And they wrote, and they spoke, and they lobbied. And when it became a conflict that escalated into arms. Many enlisted and went and fought, and some died in order to see slavery abolished. Society today says that the unborn are not human beings with the rights that you and I have for life, and can be taken, their lives can be taken through abortion, which is legal in this country. And some are even advocating now for the the legality of killing a baby after it's born. Christians look at this and say, no, this is wrong because God condemns murder and these innocent lives should not be taken. And we continue to lobby for the unborn. All through history, it it was those who followed Christ and His teachings that drew attention to the evils in society and cried out against them until society listened and changed. The improved living conditions of the human family are owed to the teachings of Christ and His followers. Listen, paganism did not produce the higher quality of living and the decency by which people treat one another today. Paganism didn't do it. Secularism didn't do this. It was Christianity that did this. 
Many atheistic thinkers today admit this and have said so in their writings. And they're afraid that the secularization of the West is going to result in an escalation of violence and mistreatment that people put upon other people. Because without the influence of Christianity, the Christian ethics that this world has been blessed with may not survive in a secular arena. In other words, since Christianity brought it, Christianity needs to be there to nurture it and to keep it. Paganism and secularism will not do so. Today there are two main sources from which people draw their worldview. Two philosophies, two ideologies, and these are the prominent ones with perhaps subcategories. But these two particular uh, ideologies could be described this way. Uh, One is divine revelation. That is the Word of God. What God has said to us. That's one ideology. The other is Darwinian evolution. In other words, the way that people attempt to explain life's three great questions, where did we come from, why are we here, and where are we going, is answerable by one or the other of these two ideologies. Now with Christianity, with divine revelation, where did we come from? God. Why are we here? God. Where are we going? God for evaluation, for judgment. That's the answer that divine revelation gives us. Now what is the answer for Darwinian evolution? Where did we come from? Hmm? Why are we here? Hmm? Where are we going? Hmm? There's no answers. There's only speculation. There's only theories. Listen. When your basic worldview is, hmm, anything is possible. Anything your mind can come up with, anything you may feel becomes right. It's a disastrous worldview to discount the standard of morality and the standard of righteousness that is God. When we have no God, even murder cannot be really said to be wrong. It may be right. Theft may be right. Adultery may be right. Any number of sins that universally people would say, no, that's wrong. It could be right if there is no God. Who are you to say? We are either the product of special creation and are responsible to our Creator, or we're just here by a series of accidents and we're all basically just sort of advanced apes. It's no wonder that sometimes people reflect their ideology, in how they act. If we're just apes, we see a lot of people today acting just like apes, do we not? I want to say this, and I want to preach the Word of God, but I also want to address the sin in society. And and Darwinian evolution has created the perfect storm for every kind of wicked, every kind of ill, every kind of murderous thing that you can imagine. There could not be a theory more suitable for racism to flourish than evolution. The death blow to racism is what Paul said that God created us all of one blood. But if evolution is true, if it is true, then there could be some races who are more evolved than others. It's logically plausible. It even makes sense depending on regional isolation, depending on genetic factors. There could be some who are more evolved, some who are less evolved. There could be some who are more human and some who are less human. Listen, that's exactly how Hitler interpreted it. The eugenicists from which Hitler drew his ideology about race, and sadly, even in this country, the eugenicists had great influence in Washington, D.C. for many years. The eugenicists believed that there are superior genetics and inferior genetics and that they have the responsibility to manipulate things so that the best genetics come up and the worst genetics go down. It is the irony of ironies 
the most amazing contradiction of pure thought that I have ever seen that there are today black civil leaders who believe that Margaret Sanger is a hero. She was a eugenicist, bought the theory hook, line, and sinker, and taught it, and even attended rallies by the Ku Klux Klan, and said it was their responsibility to rid the world of genetic inferiors, meaning black people, and weeds, meaning black people. And so her abortion clinics and her lobbying to make abortion legal was centered on black communities and still is today and funded with federal money despite their claims to the contrary. If there is a national sin today, if there is an issue for which an organization called Black Lives Matter ought to be up in arms. It is the national abortion industry that disproportionately kills thousands upon thousands of black babies every single year. And yet, there are those who defend that woman as a hero. She's not a hero, she's a fiend and her organization is a diabolically fiendish murder machine. There could not be a theory more tailor-made for the racist's use than Darwinian evolution. It justifies their hate. It justifies their opinions that they are superior. You ever notice that when people buy into the idea of a superior race, it's always their race that ends up being superior. I believe that one race is better than the other, and, and, and that means me and my race. My people are superior. And it's not just white people that thought that. Throughout history, there have been many other people, many other ethnoi, many other nations who thought that. Uh, listen, there were Japanese who thought other Japanese were inferior. There were Chinese who thought other Chinese were inferior. Listen, there were Scots who thought other Scots were inferior. There were Vikings who thought other Vikings were inferior. There were Africans who thought other Africans were inferior. And they fought and they looted and they took and they murdered based on the idea, our group is superior to your group. It is all evil. Whether it be skin color or whether it be culture or whether it be tribal or whether it be national, whatever the idea is, murdering other people and taking their stuff is a great evil and should be soundly condemned. True Christianity... True Christianity, on the other hand, does not allow one to be a racist. True Christianity shoots racism dead. For it represents all of us as being of one blood. In fact, neighbors, neighbors, who are to treat one another as we ourselves would want to be treated. Uh, Jesus said, to love your neighbor. They said, who's my neighbor? And he told the story about the Samaritan who showed kindness to a Jew. And he said, be like that one. And what he was saying is, okay, you know who your neighbor is? Those other people. Those other people, the ones you remove yourself from, the ones you put down, the ones you say aren't good, they're your neighbor. Those are the ones I'm talking about when I say love them like you love yourself. You can't be a racist when you adopt that mentality. You can't see superior, inferior when you're listening uh, to the words of Christ and putting them into practice. The, tear, the clear teachings of true Christianity moved the abolitionists to fight against the great evil of slavery. And finally, they won. It was not paganism that did this. It was not Buddhism that did this. It was not Hinduism, Confucianism, Shintoism, Mohammedism. They're still practicing slavery today. It's not secularism that did this or any other ism that ended slavery. It was Christianity. Now, to a point that is so connected to this that I, that I don't want to miss it. What is racism? 
Now we have the textbook definition, which I'll read. We're uh, familiar with that. Racism, a belief or doctrine that inherent differences among the various human racial groups, I'm using the terminology of the the definition, uh, determine cultural or individual achievement, usually involving the idea that one's own race is superior and has the right, (coughs) excuse me, to dominate others, or that a particular racial group is inferior to the others, or also it's hatred or intolerance of another race or other races. Here's another one, bigotry, similar uh, term. A person who is obstinately or intolerantly devoted to his or her own opinions and prejudices. Especially one who regards or treats the members of a group as a racial or ethnic group with hatred and intolerance. In other words, we should come to the point as was articulated by Martin Luther King Jr., we should judge people by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. That is as true as true a statement as can be made. It is based on Scripture. It is based on what God's Word said. So, we know the textbook definition. But you know what's gotten obscured today? It's gotten obscured. The issue has been, become cloudy Now, someone may be called a racist, even though he may not be a racist and have not one racist bone in his or her body. Someone may be called a racist if he or she believes in, for instance, fiscal conservatism. If you have a view of economics that you believe is good for people, and you believe that all people, whatever race they may be, is benefited by this ideology of economics. But if you believe that, some will call you a racist because they have attached race to something that race doesn't have anything to do with, except in their minds. Today, it is possible to, com- be, to be completely void of racist attitudes or racist actions, and yet be lumped together with racists. Because, for, in- for example, one will not support leftist politics. Now I want to go on record as saying this. I believe racism is a sin. I believe it's wrong. I believe our nation should repent of it. And racists should repent before God and practice what Jesus said. But I am not for empowering godless anti-Christian Marxism as the cure for this great societal ill. And I want to go on record as saying that. Marxism is a race-based system. It goes to Darwin. It goes to covetousness. It goes to envy. It goes to competition and conflict among the races. And they exploit the issue to empower a small group of people that will not bless all of humanity, but will lower them in every way that they possibly can. I am against Marxism. I am against leftist politics. I am against leftist religion. Because it has strayed away from the revealed Word of God and practices things that Jesus condemns. Let me give you an example. When they came after Jesus to arrest Him, Peter drew his sword. And he cut off the ear of one of the servants of the high priest that was there. I think he was aiming for his head. Maybe his aim was off and he just got an ear. He thought, it's time to promote my Savior. It's time to promote my Christ with violence. It's time. That seemed like time, didn't it? They've got weapons. They're coming after us. He's got a sword. Okay, it's time to rumble. It's time to fight. I'm going to get physical. He pulled his sword. He cut off an ear. And Jesus told him, Simon, put away your sword. Didn't he say that? Did Jesus say, at a boy there, Simon, I wish the rest of you had your courage? Did he say, hit him again, get the other ear? No. Simon... Put away your sword. They that live by the sword shall die by the sword. The cup that I am to drink, shall I not drink it? Now, here's what 
If if Peter had pulled out a rock, he would have said, put away your rock. If he'd pulled out a a stick, he'd have said, put away your stick. If he had hit him with a fist, he'd say, put your fist down. We are not here to advance the faith by physical conflict. We are not here to advance the principles of Christ by use of violence. We are not here to promote my kingdom in the way that earthly kingdoms are promoted. Christians, use words. We use our words. And as we use our words, the world may reply with sticks or with swords or with rocks or with fists or with financial punishment, or with political punishment, or with persecution, or even with death. But we are to still use our words. In the arena of ideas, words can win. Words can persuade. Words can be powerful. When in a debate, someone has to begin to shout and scream, and pitch a temper tantrum, and get physical, they have already demonstrated that they have lost the debate. If you can't win with your words, you have lost in the arena of ideas. What are your ideas? Articulate them. What do you think? Say so. People with minds and reason can Hear what you have to say and agree or disagree. But when violence is used as a tool to promote something, death and mayhem can result. There's a reason that we need to have a biblical world view. And this is part of the question. We can love everybody without loving everything that's in their culture. And that's where I think that we have been misled by the world to have this idea that if I love a certain people group, I should be in agreement with all aspects of their culture. To insist that whatever any culture accepts as true or valuable is good, and to say it's good, that that is disastrous nonsense. To insist that all cultural values are equally valid is to say that there is no formula for societal health, and that a society of Satan-worshipping cannibals can be just as healthy as a society of God-fearing philanthropists. If we have someone who says it's okay to kill my neighbor, boil him in a pot and eat him, and another person that says it's good to work hard and feed my neighbor, and we say, well, isn't it nice to have this multicultural unity? I'm sorry, but I don't want multicultural unity with people who think it's okay to kill their neighbors and put them in a pot and boil them and eat them. There's things about which you must look and say, no. But now here's what I want to be quick to say. Start with your own culture. Don't be like the one who had a a, a beam in his eye and was interested in the speck in someone else's eye. Start with your own cultural foibles and faults and shortcomings and address them and disconnect yourself from them. Listen, when people came to Jesus back in the day, They had to leave the world and its culture to attach themselves to Christ. Now, they may have the same music style. They may have had the same dress of clothes. They may have had the same uh, festivals and the same things. But they had to leave the sins of the world, the things in their culture that were wrong. They were expected to leave those things. If you assign the same goodness to an evil cultural thing, then Christians can no longer look at it and say, no! Listen, there are things that are wrong because they're wrong. What happens in such a society is the Christian then becomes the object of scorn. Listen, today, listen, 
Today, the worst sin you can commit is to call something a sin. The worst sin you can commit is to believe there's something called sin and say that's what it is. That's where our society has become. The Christian is judgmental. The Christian is a bigot because he condemns certain practices as sinful rather than accepting it or normalizing it. So the judges are judged and the evaluators are evaluated. But rather than just saying to the Christians, no, we disagree with you, they must persecute and even kill them. That is where we are. Statements are met with sticks. Preaching is met with persecution. This is why, like every other dispensation in the history of the planet, sad to say the Scriptures declare it, the Scriptures foretell it, that the dispensation we call the age of grace or the church age will also end in failure. Our society will not turn to God, will not be brought to repentance, will not turn wholesale to Jesus Christ, but shall come worse and worse. Because the light of Christ that was rejected and killed when he was here, that same light will be rejected and killed because his followers promote it. Jesus said this in John chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. These things I have spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. In other words, there will be those who think that killing Christians is the good thing to do. You know, the Apostle Paul, as I said, was the ambassador for racial healing because the gospel is the unifier. We are one blood through Jesus. We can sit together in fellowship and love one another as brothers and sisters in perfect peace and harmony and love. That's what he was all about. And so I came across a scripture one time and it perplexed me. I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to Titus chapter 1. And when I first read this, uh, I was a little bit taken aback. I didn't get it. I I had to think it through. I had to process it and do a little study and and ask for uh, the Lord to help me understand what was being said here. And in Titus chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is talking about the false teachers because they're coming in and they're corrupting the gospel of Christ and they're perverting the truths of God. And so on his tirade of condemnation to them, he makes this statement. One of themselves, speaking of the people in Crete, by the way, because this is where this was happening, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans, that is the people who live in Crete, are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Now, when I read that, it sounded like He's making a generalization about a people group. He's saying these Cretans, these people who live in Crete, they're they're liars. They're they're beast-like. They're lazy indulgers and overeaters. He says this witness is true. Wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. I read that and I thought, Paul, is that Bigotry? Is that snobbishness? What are you saying? He's making a social commentary about a people group. Then I thought about it again. Paul was quoting one of their own people. One of their own philosophers. One of their own people who was an evaluator of his own culture. And he said these things about the Cretans. And Paul said, I agree with him. So was he making a generalization? Yes, he was. He was making a generalization about a people group. That didn't mean that every single person in Crete fit that generalization. It didn't mean that every one of them all the time were liars. No more than all of us are liars. So I studied it out and I thought, is making a generalization or is making an observation about a certain culture, is that something that's good? And I came to the conclusion that sometimes it is. The prophets of God were often sent to the nation of Israel to condemn them for their national sins. And Jesus often said this, this is an evil 
an adulterous generation and will be judged. Jesus pointed at the cultural flaws and foibles of his own country, of his own people. This is why when Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, he said, save yourselves from this untoward generation. In other words, come out from among them. Don't be like them. They're wrong. You come out and you be right. Does a culture that allows for human sacrifice deserve praise or rebuke? Does a culture that demeans and represses women deserve praise or rebuke? Does a culture that promotes sexual promiscuity and celebrates deviancy deserve praise or rebuke? Does a culture that believes it may conquer and rule over other people groups because they can deserve praise or rebuke? Does a culture that allows for the stealing Stealing from others if the other's skin is a different color or if they are from another area or tribe, does that deserve praise or rebuke? So, if I were to criticize someone because of his color, I would be a bigot and a racist. But if I were to criticize an element of someone's culture, I may be a prophet, I may be a preacher, I may be a friend, I may be an honest evaluator of truth, and I may should have a hearing. I want to close with six points of why racism, racism is wrong, because I want to nip it in the bud. Racism is wrong, all of it, and here's why. First of all, racism is wrong because it is based on false science. True science shows that racial differences are extremely minimal and unimportant. Secondly, racism is wrong because it is often based on false religion. False religion can promote racism. Third, it is wrong because it is based on pride. If humility ruled people, we wouldn't be trying to figure out who's up and who's down, who's better and who's worse. We would just love one another like we're supposed to. It's wrong because it is fueled by fear and hate. And make no mistake about it, racism is just plain and simple hate. That's what it is. Racism is wrong because it is unjust to charge someone with a fault because of their skin color or racial identity is just unfair. It is unjust. And six, racism is wrong because God's word condemns it. Acts chapter 10, verse 28. Then he said unto them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. Now Peter was talking about their customs. Here's what he said. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. God says don't do that. What's the answer? What is the answer? The answer is the same answer that the Apostle Paul, when he was there in the Areopagus, talking to the intellectual elite of his day, Jesus Christ was crucified and rose again. And that faith in Him makes us new creatures. That's the same answer we have today. It is the only answer. Matthew 22 verse 39 says, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And if you love your neighbor as you love yourself, you cannot be a racist. Because Jesus said your neighbor includes them too. Luke chapter 6 31 and as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. If you believe that and practice that, you cannot be a racist. You cannot be a bigot. You certainly cannot be a slaver or a slave trader or a slave owner if you believe that. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 5 says this. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. This is, this is good. You want to have a value system? 
Here it is. This is good. Who will have all men. And by the way, that means all people all over the world. God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the common human family, the man Christ Jesus. Let me ask you this. What color was Jesus? The answer is, it doesn't matter one bit. My idea is he probably took after his mother's side of the family. Jewish maiden named Mary. But it doesn't matter what color he was. Bickering over that is nonsense. It makes no point. Jesus came for all people. One blood. One blood. And listen, when you are saved, you become part of God's royal priesthood. And it doesn't matter where your background may be, what your ethnicity may be, what your culture may be. When you come to Jesus, you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. And we are ruled by the law of love. Dear Father, it's my prayer that whatever vestigial remnants of racism may be in any of those who hear this message, Lord, that it would be repented of and forsaken and rejected. And Lord, that we would replace it with an understanding that cultures may have evils within them, including our own. And that our own hearts may yet harbor some things that have yet to come under the dominance of Christ. Lord, I pray that we would look inside first and we would examine our own hearts first and determine to love others as we love our own selves and to use our words in areas where we may disagree about policy or theory or ideology. But Lord, to develop and promote a sound scriptural worldview that has the ability to see what's right and what's wrong because you have revealed it to us in your word, and to lovingly present that truth to all that would hear. I pray for healing for our land. I pray for healing in our churches. I pray for healing in our society. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless. Let's stand together, and we'll sing a couple of songs.